ಖಂಡಮಂಡಲಾಕಾರಂ ವ್ಯಾಪ್ತ ಯೇನ ಚರಾಚರ ತತ್ಪದ ದರ್ಶಿದ ಯೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಅಜ್ಞಾನತಿರಾಂಧಾಂಜನ ಶಲಾಕಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರ್ಮಿಲ ಯೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಗುರುರ್ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಗುರುರ್ವಿಷ್ಣು ಗುರುರ್ದೇವೋ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರ ಗುರುರ್ ಸಾಕ್ಷಾತ್ ಪರಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮಃ ಸೊ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಡೌನ್ ಟು ದ ಟೀಚರ್ we go into today's subject hmm? shakti the divine energy yes hmm. now since ancient times <coughs> in country where i come from energy or para shakti has always been worshiped as the feminine energy hmm. in fact in the dasha mahavidyas which talks about the 10 manifestations of shakti or energy the word shakti means energy now 10 manifestations of energy in general there are innumerable manifestations you me the flower that blooms the, the all manifestation of shakti <coughs> of energy but they have broadly the tantras have divided it into 10 categories of energy which are worshipped by those we all love the energies right by all who love energy now in these 10 categories some are what are called as ghora devatas fierce devatas now why are there these fierce devatas because life is not all hunky dory and sweet and nice there are all kinds of things happening in the world so the energy represents all that happens good or evil sometimes in a very violent way sometimes in a very peaceful way all these are manifestations of the divine bhadrakali is one of the first dasha mahavidya you wonder energy which is worshiped as a goddess look so grotesque the tongue is out hmm the blood is dripping from the tongue we'll go to better uh, more peaceful things don't worry hmm. and uh, on her neck she wears a garland of human heads and she's dancing on the chest of the great lord shiva who is supposed to be the sustainer of the universe the supreme being of which we are of who is an essence of all living beings and this is considered feminine energy so this feminine energy is all, i will explain to you later why the human garland of skulls and so on this energy which is called para shakti also is the primordial infinite energy which transforms into different states of energy as different beings different levels of consciousness and so on and so forth in total it's called para shakti the supreme energy now there is also there are also the shanta devatas the peaceful deities which means when all the commotion is over when everything is at rest then you have the shanta devatas where the mind is calm and you worship them in a quiet and peaceful way then from there comes the deity of wisdom who is called raja rajeshwari tripura sundari devata who is worshiped in several forms also as the devi of shri vidya upasana now the shri vidya is a mantric signs signs of mantras in which certain syllables are uttered and the energy is activated now this is special about the ancient tantric and yogic wisdom in india that when a universal thing is described it's also linked to the to particular <laughs> to the particular so while this is the this is the supreme primordial energy that that also atomic energy magnetism everything comes from the root which is this para shakti 
Today the whole world runs on energy and this is the root of all energy. Now, the good news is that Tantra says, the science of Tantra says, this infinite, absolute, almost out of reach Shakti also dwells in every living being, of also in every human being, as the energy that activates the whole system. In its aspect as completeness, it's called Purna. In its, complete, in its uh, manifestation as the individual consciousness, it is also called Jiva. The energies in the Jiva are not different from the energy of the Supreme Being. Therefore, the Upanishad said, Purnam Adha Purnam Idam, that is complete, that energy. This which, in, which is in us is also complete. Now therefore, if this, you can't get hold of that supreme energy in its universal aspect, we don't have that big arms to embrace it, nor does, is our mind so big to understand it, nor can we using our senses find it. Although the senses need to work, they need this energy to work. Right? Now, <coughs> therefore, how can we, you know, in India, every school of philosophy is called a darsana. What is the meaning of a darshan? Those who know Hindi, Sanskrit, darshan means coming face to face, seeing something that is revealed. Each section, each philosophy, each school of philosophy is called a darsana. Yoga darsana, Sankhya darsana, Vedanta darsana, Mehmamsa, many darsanas. Now the speciality is that while the darshanas describe the infinite energy and how the universe is linked with each other and what energies work in keeping us together and also making us separate, the energies that give life and also the energies that take you away in death, while all this is described, it is also described how in a small way it can be tapped in a human being. And the way to tap this energy is only through ourselves. We cannot reach out to that energy which is probably the source of nuclear energy itself or electricity itself. It's like trying to directly reach that energy. It's like pushing your fingers into the electric plug. Not plug, what is that thing called? Where you put the plug in, socket. While the energy is used for light, it's used for fans, it's used for various things. The touch of a button, the same energy can kill you if you touch your fingers into the socket. So it's a tremendous energy. So since Parashakti needs to be contacted in some way, it can only be done through the inner Shakti, which is given to every human being. And Tantra believes that this individual energy, which is of course a manifestation of the Supreme Energy in a slightly less frequency at the moment, is stored in every human being in the end of the spine in a center called the Muladhara. Now, generally the energy is sleep. There is no other way you can contact this energy. You can worship it. You can praise the energy, you can be devotional to the energy, but if you need to touch, to feel the experience of the energy, you have to touch it in yourself. There is no other way. And how do you touch it in yourself? By go looking into the fact that in us, in all human beings, in the form of a coiled snake, this tremendous energy resides at the bottom of the spine. Well. You can't find it on the anatomy table. We're talking about subtle energies, not about something physical which can be picked up with the pincers and put in a test tube. But it is the same energy which the human being uses in his acts of sex, in libido. It's the same energy which the human being enjoys 
but which when sublimated becomes divine energy. So therefore this stress on controlling your senses and turning them into sublime thoughts. It's not done just for a moral obligation. It's because if your energy is being dissipated all the time to the senses, you may not be able to gather it together and project it where you want it to. And when it is directed towards the muladhara, then this energy, which is called Kali or Rajaraj, whatever name you want to give this energy, she, she awakens from there. She sleeps like a coil separate and there are ways and means, mantras, sounds, exercises, techniques by which she is awakened. Of course, devotionally, not by striking with a stick, but very in a very devotional manner, if she can be awakened. Now this supreme energy called Parashakti becomes the creative energy in all human beings. It is the creative energy, but it's manifested as a creative energy much more than a physical creation. It becomes an abstract, at the same time tangible energy that radiates from a person who has awakened this energy. And this energy is the root source of our reach towards the universal energy. This is called by various names, Devi, Devata, Bhujangi, Kundalini, any number of names have been given to it. So, <clears throat> the Saundarya Lahiri is one beautiful text which the great Adi Shankara, you know normally Adi Shankara is associated with Vedanta. He wrote the commentaries on the Upanishads, but he was also a great practitioner of the Tantra of the Kundalini Shakti and how to ar arouse it and so on. He came from a very uh, special family in the south of India who were themselves practitioners of Sri Vidya, Upasana. And therefore, he celebrated the movement of this energy from the bottom of the spine to the Sahasrara, which is yeah, by writing this wonderful text called the Sondari Lahiri. Saundarya Lahiri means uh, ecstasy and Saundarya is beautiful. That means the ecstasy of beauty. So, this is the Parashakti that we are discussing now. And we can also touch it, we can also activate it, we can also through mantra, through tantra, through, through kriya, through various methods that are adopted. So. What happens when this is aroused? A human being, while the body remains like a human being, the mind becomes different. First, the mind becomes full, fully concentrated on whatever it wants to put its attention on, which is called one-pointed attention. Two, the energies which are normally dissipated are all gathered together in one. The powerful mind. Are there any physical benefits of the Yes, because we are touching the root of all the energy that remains in the universe. The energy level of the human being, even physically and mentally of course, increases. And then spiritually, the first, the energy is so strong that it burns out all the dross and makes it really clear, fresh and pure. This is the whole teaching about the great energy called Parashakti. Why is it worshipped as the feminine gender? Because according to the Puranas and according to Saundari Lahiri, before creation, everything was silent without any movement, which is called Shivam, absolute bliss and rest. And then a small movement, a ripple happened in the silence. That ripple is called the Bindu and that is the Shakti. And from that ripple came this whole universe. It, it kind of, if, you, if we described it some years ago, it should have been difficult to understand. But today, since we know about nuclear fission, we know that a small movement inside the quantum particle can bring about Hiroshima Nagasaki. 
Now, in each one of us, there is this potential of a creative, not distractive, creative Hiroshima Nagasaki. Not the distractive part. We do. If it falls into wrong hands, then it certainly becomes distractive. Therefore, rules and regulations have been set up that a person becomes good, not harmful to others, and so on before he learns this. This is a good valve, a kind of a safety valve. Unless your mind is good enough, you will not be able to tap this energy. And if somebody says, oh, I don't believe it, I am very thankful about it. Imagine going into the wrong hands. It's like handing over a nuclear button to a chimp. Worse than that, sometimes human beings are worse than that. I don't know if you know this, but the difference between a chimp and a human being is that the chimp has one extra chromosome. You remove that and we have the same number of chromosomes. But it's very difficult for a monkey to decide to destroy the whole world. We can, because we have a brain to think. Now, unless this thinking brain is made more compassionate and is good for others and not only for oneself, I think no one can arouse this energy. If it has accidentally happened in some cases, it has always ended in disaster. Disaster for the person and disaster for others. So that is why it was kept so secret and it was not preached about. We have now come to a threshold where we need to move forward. No more should we be satisfied with what we call the frontal lobe evolution. We need to move forward. So I think it's about time we looked into these matters and why would we miss this extraordinary potential which is in each one of us? Even a little bit of arousal of that energy can make you, first of all, more creative, more full of energy, stronger physically and mentally, and take you finally to the wisdom where you discover the all-pervading energy that's in this universe. So, this is why I took it out from the hidden pages and decided to open it up to everyone. Uh, knowing fully well that without good intentions, nobody will anyway be able to use it. Mm. So, this is the topic we were discussing. I don't want to go into the details of how many centers the energy should go through and where and so on. We dis discuss that in the Kriya Yoga classes. We don't need to go into it now. But I need to tell you that this energy is not anybody's monopoly. It's with everybody. If you only know the right way for arousing this energy, then you find that you, the energy in you, and that all-pervading supreme energy from which even energies like nuclear, magnetism, electricity, gravity, everything has come about is very much there in all of us to be tapped. And as the human being evolves, I think slowly, slowly they will discover it. But why not do it faster? Why wait? How many lives can we wait if you believe in past births? How many lives should we wait? Now, there are these seed sounds called the Vijaksharas. They're called seed sounds. They don't have a meaning actually per se, but they have an effect on the psyche. Like cream, cream, cream and so on. These sounds, when chanted or, or used in a proper way, Targeting the centers which are in your system, the energy manifests through these centers in different ways. There is the fiery energy, there is this quiet flowing energy, there is this solid energy, there is this energy which is light, there is this energy which is sound. Everything can be activated in this human frame with the proper sounds which you need to learn 
on how to activate this. And believe me, it's not so dangerous that you go mad or something, don't worry about that. I think humanity's brain has now advanced enough to kind of take the shock of many things. Of course, it can be a shock because it's powerful energy. All the ancient stories you have heard about saints and others performing miracles, doing it, they are the people who tap this energy, who knew how to tap it. So now questions. Not emptiness, but let me come to this. Um, prakriti, the word prakriti is used for the universe, the material of the universe, the entire material of the universe is prakriti. So, you see, this concept is very interesting. All mass, all material is only energy vibrating at a certain frequency. There is no matter, nothing which is separate from energy. Mass is also energy. Energy vibrating in the grossest frequency is called solid energy. As it, as the vibration, as the frequency increases, it becomes subtler and subtler, but it's all energy. And this energy is always there. It can be, it cannot be subtracted. You cannot add to it. This whole energy together is called Prakriti. Right. Now, Prakriti also has a consciousness and that consciousness which is aware of the Prakriti and wherever Prakriti is present, the consciousness as a witness is always present, that is Purusha. It is not nothing, it's the core of one's consciousness. Well, in some schools it's called nothing because it is not a thing, it's a no thing rather. It's, so some, it may be called Shunya, but Shunya is not nothing. Shunya is zero. Zero is not nothing. The number of zeros you add adds value to one. Right? So, Purusha is the conscious part of it. And Prakriti is a material frequency. And with every frequency, with every change of matter, the frequencies are changing. And there is something that operates these frequencies. This is the Purusha. The conscious operator of the energies of Prakriti is Purusha. But usually Purusha is in quietness. So it could be mistaken for nothing. But it is not nothing. It is the potential of all the energy that has become active. It, it, let's put it this way. Energy with consciousness in its potential form is Purusha. Energy with its consciousness in kinetic form is Prakriti. This is what the Sankhya Pravajjana Sutra says. Since you are referred to Sankhya. Hmm? And therefore, in all human beings, both are there. Durga Puja is the Navaratri Puja. In India, also abroad nowadays, all Indians celebrate the different manifestations of the deity for nine days, the Navaratri Puja. So, it's Actually, worshipping that infinite energy in the form of Durga is also called Mahishasura Mardini because she is supposed to be the energy that slays the evil that comes in the form of a buffalo. We won't go into the details right now because that is a complete satsang. Every Navaratri day, one satsang for one deity. So, in nine days, we can finish the nine <laughs> deities. So, this is not the but you are right, Navaratri is, is performed for offering respect to the deity in nine manifestations. And Durga is the deity, because Durga is not, Durga is, is the symbolization of the energy in both its quiet form as well as in its uh, 
violent form because Durga holds a sword and she sits on a tiger. Hmm. But Durga Puja is a wonderful thing because it places the feminine gender at a high level. Everybody worships Durga in some way. So when people say that uh, women have always been discriminated and so on, I think that came later. I think uh, India in the early days, woman was worshipped as the manifestation of Shakti. What you worship, you cannot look down upon, can you? You cannot. So this is the importance of Durga Puja. More than Ga Ganesh Puja, I think Durga Puja should be done in every place. Where you sanctify the greatness of the feminine energy, Shakti. Mm. Even behind every successful man, there is a strong Shakti. That's what they say. <laughs>
temple architecture connection here. I am saying from my understanding of the yogic and tantric practices. From there I am interpreting what you are saying. Yeah. <clears throat> Head off to what you seem to be more intelligent and more experiential to you. Adopt only what is experiential for you. You cannot ad adopt what is not experiential for you. Uh, that is also one way of looking at divinity. But from my understanding and from my experience, divinity is experienced in each human being, in each one of us. And if this, this divinity is known, that divinity is known also. But I think, um, wait, I, I'll tell you an example. Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa was Swami Vivekananda's guru. He was almost uh, illiterate, could barely sign his name. He started his worship of the divine. He did not think it exists in the mind or inside. He worshipped the Divine Mother as Kali in the temple, separate, outside. But after worshipping and after wishing that he would have a vision there, not here, the experience he got, the first vision he got was actually that the Goddess was in, inside him. So, I am saying this. I think if you are sincere and if you set your prejudices aside, even if you think of divinity outside and worship divinity, that divinity will reveal itself in you, inside you. The importance is the devotion and the effort you put into it. How to prove to others because by that time it's become such a big conflict. <laughs> Don't prove it. <laughs> Let's do our thing. Day to day life say, this is my way, this is your way, thank you very much. <laughs> That's the only way, there's no way you can... Hmm? <laughs> I don't think so, because human... look. Let's look at it in a biological way, okay? Every human being, every human body has both male and female hormones. Yes or no? Yes. When the female hormone increases, then one is a female. When the male hormone is more, then one is a male. Yes. But the energy in both male and female is the same. So it's not as if because the energy is feminine, this energy we are discussing, that it is easier for women to find it or difficult for men to find it. But actually there is no such differentiation. I can understand that perhaps the element of devotion may be a little more feminine than man's emotions. But then I think, you know, there is a concept of Ardhanari Swara, where Shiva and Shakti are together in one being. So, when the mind, the body may remain masculine, but the mind gets the emotions of like, you know, a, a man has, probably has never experienced the devotion of giving birth to a child. Or giving milk to a child. Or holding the child in his hand and loving the child. A man perhaps hasn't had that experience. Generally it's the woman who has. So that quality of compassion and looking after has to be developed also in the masculine, in the, in the man. Then perhaps it's easier for a man to touch that. Now the woman already possesses it. So it may be in some sense what you said, but I don't believe it because I don't agree with it because I think both men and women have an equal, uh, what, 
potential, more than potential, the access, access to the Shakti. Yeah, it's true, but I understand in reality, if you look back, you don't find too many yoginis, find more yogis, more rishis, less rishinis. <laughs> now, there is a reason for that. There are other socio-economic factors that get into this from old times. Um, plus, but it's not entirely true that there were no femin female yoginis, not entirely true. If you go back to First of all, let me say, Shakti itself is worshipped as feminine. Point number one. Point number two, if you go back into history and look at the great rishis, you will find also female rishis, but they were not spreading the word. They would rather keep it to themselves. And those who come under their influence are affected by it. Gargi was a great uh, rishi, a lady, who was so powerful that in a discussion she says that she says to the great sage Yajnavalkya, if you don't answer this question, your head is going to fall off your shoulders. That is powerful. Then you have mm, the, uh, the great sage Yajnavalkya, the Rishi, his wife Maitri, he had two wives. I think the concept of sannyas came much later. He had two. And one of them, Maitri, when he goes, he says, I am going to give up everything and go to the forest. She says, I will also come with you to the forest. Why are you going to the forest? Take me with you. And there is a lively discussion in the, in the Brihadharanyaka Upanishad between Maitri and Yajnavalkya. And if Maitri grasped it, definitely she has reached a high level of spiritual development. Then in India, we have the great saints who were fem female, like, uh, can you send somebody? Sharadama. Bhai Ravi Brahmani. Meera Bhai, I, I was trying to see if somebody is saying Meera Bhai. Ananda Mohima, yes. So, there have been, but the, the Indian society, for instance, especially in India, there is something about a feminine modesty and things, so we will keep quiet, we don't say anything. And then the, there was not that kind of, even today, if you want to go up to the Himalayas, it's not such an easy thing for a woman to go alone. Man can go alone and do all these things. Things are changing, of course. I think things should change. I think if more women get into the picture, then the men might lose. Mm. But it's not a bad idea. It's a good thing. Think times are changing and you need to change with it. And I think in Karnataka, among the Lingayats, there is a great saint whose name, a lady who named Akka Mahadevi. She was so advanced and she decided to discard her clothes. She never wore any clothes. She, they, in the picture, she is always depicted out of modesty because she has long hair and it's coming up to here like this. But I think she wore nothing. And she was a great yogi respected by the founders of the Lingayat movement, Basaveshwara and so on and so forth. So, there are, I agree with you, there are less due to various reasons, socio and so on, cultural reasons maybe. Now, I want to tell you a story about a, a lady saint, a lady yogini, who pretended as if she didn't know anything, but was a great yogini. I am talking about none other than, somebody said here, Sharada Devi, who was the consort of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. She didn't learn anything. She was illiterate. She just stayed with him and served him and learned lots of things by that. You know, you don't have to study so much. In contact with a powerful magnet, you also become a magnet. If the iron is clean, without rust, 
So, she learned a lot, a great deal, but she always said, I don't know. No. Ask somebody. So, what happened was, one of the direct disciples of Swami Vivekananda, who later on became, uh, but she lived for a long time. Many of the direct disciples of Ramakrishna passed away, but she lived for a very, very long time. So, one of the direct disciples of Swami Vivekananda, whose name was Swami Virajananda, who was also once the president of the Ramakrishna mission, he suddenly found that his meditation was kind of becoming very dry. There is no feeling. It is intellectual, no feeling, no heart, only the mind. A person who has been raised to the stature of the president of the Ramakrishna mission and who is a direct disciple of Swami Vivekananda. He is the only man, only head of the Ramakrishna mission who in whose photograph you see has a big beard. The rest are all clean shaved. Okay. Now, he, uh, somebody told him, this problem can be solved if you probably go and meet Holy Mother Sharda Devi. She was still alive and she was very old and she was living in Calcutta somewhere. So maybe you should go and meet her, she might be able to help you. So he went and uh, he saluted her and she said, come, come, sit down. Uh, she asked, you are a Narayan's disciple, so that means Swami Vivekananda's disciple. He said, uh, yes. Uh, so, what, what, why did you come? I, I came to see me. He said, no, I have a problem. I came to ask you. He said, my meditation has become completely dry. There is no heart to it. There is no feeling. It's just like some blank. He started like this, the dialogue. She said, I don't know anything about this. <laughs> what did I learn? I didn't learn anything. But I was with Thakur for a husband for a long time. Therefore, so where did he ask you to meditate? On which center? So he said he uh, his center was this, the cerebral center, Sasra. Um, she said, okay. I don't know if this is going to work, but from tomorrow shift your meditation center to the heart and see for some time what happens. So he went back. He went off to a quiet place in Mayavati, in the Himalayas, stayed there for one month, shifted his attention here, everything came back. I'm saying this because you asked me this question. She was, of course, a great yogini, but she preferred to remain unknown, modest. This could be the reason also. Uh, Gayatri Mantra, yes, you can chant if your body is clean and you are chanting it early in the morning at Sandhya, you can chant. Bijaksharas are from their um, powerful seed sounds which are likely to awaken energies in you and unless you follow certain norms you may not be able to um, control these energies. So it's better either follow the complete procedure and also better to take it from somebody. Don't read in a book and start saying him, claim him and all that. Mm -hmm. Especially whom, what and all should never be used. Uh, take it from someone who knows, who knows you properly, to say how good and how ready you should be to take the mantra. Gayatri, yes, if you keep clean, it's been prescribed for all people who are clean physically and who try at least to keep the mind uh, clean uh, to chant. So it's the Vedic Gayatri, which is Vedic Gayatri. You chant the Vedic Gayatri, right? Yeah. And so were you initiated in your childhood or somebody gave it to you later? Some, my, my Guruji gave it to me. Okay. Vijakshara, be a little more careful using it. It's more potent. Okay. So. Chant the Gayatri. Okay.
Chanting, chanting the Gayatri randomly. No, no. Ah. You need to have a some time this discussion with, with someone who knows and then do it better, not chant it like that, since he's not there. <laughs> no. Gayatri, yes, you can chant, but Gayatri is to be chanted during the sandhyas which means early morning, dawn, dusk and perhaps at midday. There is also a third sandhya which people don't even know, I think. When the trees start and start to lengthen their shadows, also there is a uh, sandhya. Thing about this is that the best time to chant will be early in the morning. And uh, yeah, that's about it. And, oh, I forgot, Gayatri is not to be chanted loudly. Gayatri is not to be sung. Gayatri is to be chanted silently. Very important to note. Nowadays, I went once to Kutch and somebody had fitted the Gayatri in the reverse horn of his car. So whenever he reverses, Om Bhur Bhur. This is not the way to chant the Gayatri. Gayatri is very sacred. You need to chant it, not sing it. The Gayatri has a chandas. It, you see, each mantra in the Veda has a style. It has a certain... Like, Om Bhur Bhuvashva Tat Savitar Yadi Mahi Diyo Yohana Prachodayat Isn't it different from Om Bhur Bhur? That's a bhajan. It's not the guy. See, I don't think that's the right way to chant the guy. This we all agree. I agree. Many of us who are in this field agree that the matter that you see is a very small part of matter. Yes. And the actions of matter that is visible to us or which is tangible to us is a result of actions that are taking place in matter which is not visible to us. Right. So these things like bijaksharas, the sounds, they are the effect the primordial matter which we refer to as akasha. Akasha is not the sky. Uh, Akasha, sky is called Akasha because it looks uh, blue, but when you go close, it, it, there is no color there. So, Akasha is a primordial matter, which includes all this dark matter, white matter, if there is any violet matter, whatever matter. It is the essence of all matter is Akasha. So, the mantras and the chants and the practices one does, starts by affecting that and then translates it into the visible matter that we have. So, which is why yogis are able to even manipulate visible matter because they know how to handle that which is connected to this matter from where it originates. So, the work is all done in the Akasha. It manifests itself in the five senses, the visible world. The problem is, unfortunately, why did it go away and where did it go away? <laughs> why are we now depending on our aeroplanes? I have to go back on Swiss Air to India. So, <laughs> I think we lost it somewhere. And we need to go back there. And now to go back there, if you need to go back there, we need the help of scientists today more than anybody else. So, my attempt has been to get this idea into the minds of the scientists so that they don't, they're not prejudiced against understanding these matters, so their minds are open to look into these matters. If they look into these matters, today, especially in particle physics, quantum physics and so on, 
we are equipped in some way to at least get a glimpse of what happened before, like anti-gravity. I'm saying it is possible, but the techniques have been forgotten. Now, I have a suggestion for you. Since you are interested in the subject, you may not be able to fly using it, but since you are interested in the theory of the subject, and perhaps some practical can be worked out, I don't know. It has to be worked out in research centers and universities. It can be worked out in a forest hermitage. Um, I don't even know if there's a mathematical explanation to this. This I don't know. I'm saying this because you have maths. But there is a particular text which is very old, which is called the Vimana Adhikara. Vimana Adhikara. Um, the existing copy that I know of, which is in Sanskrit, is in the an old library called the Saraswati Mahal Library in Tanjur in the south in Tamil Nadu. Fortunately, the Adair Theosophical Society has an English translation, very old translation, which is probably in their archives. Now, the, it, I don't think it's an accurate translation, but to a great extent, I think they've the person who translates has done a good work. So it's a good idea to start with that and then get some Sanskrit people to scholars to translate it. Since you are interested in the subject, you might find many guidelines which you can discuss with scientists rather than with me. You know what I mean. I'm not that expert on Vimana Adhikara. Uh, but all this is because, you see, it's like this. Let's. But what the Vimana Adhikara basically discusses is very interesting. It says we are all walking, we are sitting, we are stuck to the ground because our magnetism is opposite to the earth magnetism. We are stuck. It says if our magnetism could be made the same as earth magnetism, then it will push you off, it will repel you. Based on that, they created all these flying machines. So, look into it. I'm not technical on this. I'm not so sure. I'm just a seed of an idea for you. Unfortunately, I don't know any shortcuts, but um, since Navaratri is coming and you might be doing the Durga Puja yeah. at home. Yeah. Yes. So when you do the Durga Puja, invoke the Durga into your heart after doing the Puja. Just in, I'm say, come, invoke into your heart. And then chant this mantra, which has one Bijakshara. Hmm. You can chant, not from the book. I'm, if I tell you, then it doesn't, it ceases to be from a book, right? So the Vijakshara for uh, Durga is Dum. So, keep your hand in your heart center. After you do your Durga Puja, put your hand here and chant 108 times Dum Durga Anama. Nothing will happen, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> That you need to sit with some person who knows your character properly, who knows your lifestyle. You should sit with a person, a teacher, discuss that and then we can find out what is appropriate. Can't say offhand. It depends on your nature, it depends on various factors. Are you asking me to sit with you in this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <yes. laughs> you took Kriya, right? Yeah. So you have some mantras with you? Yes. So keep chanting it. 
and the appropriate deity will come to you. But uh, how do I know that which one? Hmm? How do you know? I'm saying you keep doing it and one day you will realize this is your appropriate deity. That's what I'm saying. Instead of you trying to find it. Let the deity find you. Yeah. Stick to this, what, what you were taught. Yeah. Huh? And then le report to me, this is my deity. <laughs> I don't know that. That you will figure out, not now, <laughs> when it happens. <laughs>